So without any further ado, Tyler Zuba. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Tyler. Thank you, Matt, for such a fantastic introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm really excited to have a chance to talk with you today about early career transitions. Um, and by that, I mean a whole load of things. Um, we'll get to some of the details of that in a moment. Um, but as an early career professional myself, and I imagine many of you in the audience are also, um, we go through a whole lot of, um, of uh, changes over the course of our careers, um, dealing with everything from uh, starting new jobs to entering new roles, managing projects and teams. Um, I'm going to turn up my volume just a little bit. Thank you, Jennifer, for uh, bringing that up. I'm about as loud as I can get right now without creating a lot of distortion in the sound, um, but, um, but we can work on it if it becomes an issue. Thank you for mentioning it. Um, so yeah, a lot of transitions in our early careers, and so I'm excited to talk with you about a few of those today. Um, so I do want to mention, uh, for those of you who are of the Twitter persuasion, uh, I definitely am, uh, please feel free to tweet using the hashtag uh, ESLN transitions. Um, and that way we can just keep some of that conversation together and also share a little bit of what we talk about with uh, those who aren't able to be here today. Um, you can also find me on Twitter at silent underscore D, which you also see on the screen. So before, uh, before I launch in, I should give a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, so I'm coming at this as um, an early career professional. I've been at U of R for four years. It's my first professional position. Uh, I'm also coming at this um, at an institution where I'm lucky to be able to travel to some conferences and do stuff uh, with ESLN and with CLRC. Um, so I'm lucky to have that. Also, I'm a young white guy, so my experience may or may not represent yours. Um, so I'm excited to hear from all of you about the kinds of experiences you've had and whether or not um, what I'm saying resonates with you. To that end, you probably saw in the registration that uh, I asked you to take a brief survey um, asking about what kinds of transitions you found challenging or fruitful over the course of your work, as well as gathering some stories, and you'll see some of those later on. Um, so I was asking about this list of, uh, of challenging or fruitful transitions, and this was just, uh, just a sample list. There were a couple of others that came up. Here are the ones that rose to the top, um, the ones that most people Said, uh, said that they found important in their careers or that they're learning about right now. Um, so the first one, learning how to say no to so many projects and opportunities coming our way. Uh, the second, leading committees and teams. And the third, uh, settling into ambiguous project-based roles, which is a situation I found myself in this last year. Um, well, we might have a little bit of time at the end to talk about some of the others. Um, but absolutely, please feel free to, uh, to bring up any questions in the chat uh, as we go. Um, also, I should mention, I love audience participation. Um, it would be really boring if this were just me talking at a camera and telling you about how I've done it. Like I said, I'll be giving some quotes from that survey. Um, but also, I'd love to hear your, uh, your suggestions for um, ways that people can approach these kinds of transitions in their career. And we'll pause at some points during the talk to, to catch some of those chat comments. So uh, the other thing I should mention, I love tea. So whenever you see this icon, uh, I will be stepping away for a moment to give you a chance to, uh, to respond in the chat box, making myself a cup of tea. And, um, and we'll be able to have a little bit more conversation that way. Um, so with that, I have our first question. I'm wondering, uh, are you ready to participate and talk with me today? I'm going to put up a poll so that you can respond. Thank you, Jennifer, for raising your hand. I appreciate it. Um, so I am going to, uh, to pause for a second and make sure the polling feature is working. So thank you for responding. Uh, 
Okay, I see a lot of you chiming in. Um, I can't see, uh, Diane, I can't see exactly what you're seeing on your side. It looks like a lot of people are making their way in. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. No. Um, try it again. Okay, I see a lot of you coming in. I think I think the point has been made. Um, so it looks like a lot of you, yes, happy to talk. Um, thank you uh, to those of you who are being honest and uh, will be listening today. That is totally fine as well. Um, all right. So with that, um, we'll launch right in. All right. So the first thing that people wanted to talk about today was the importance of saying no when there are so many opportunities coming your way. Um, so this is an incredibly scientific chart that you're seeing in front of you. Um, this is my attempt to represent um, how the course of, in the course of our careers, um, we learn to get engaged in different commitments in our profession over time. Um, there's a stage at the beginning where you're just getting started and, you know, brand new world of libraries and information around you. And you're trying to find ways to fit in and trying to find the right opportunities for you. So you say yes to a few things, more things come your way. People get to know you as somebody who they can rely on um, to handle projects that come your way and to take on new and exciting tasks. And that works out well for a while until you cross a little bit of a threshold. I've marked that 100% there as um, just a representation of uh, the capacity that we all have. We all have the ability to take on a lot of things, but there is some limit where at some point we're pushing above 100%. And if that happens for a little stretch of time here or there, that can be good. We all go through times like that, the busy times of the year. April is one of those for me. Um, but if that becomes really extended, um, you risk uh, looking like our poor little emoji on the left and, um, and feeling a bit burnt out, a little bit overwhelmed. And this is, uh, this is a really common stage that I think a lot of us go through. What we hope to achieve, I think, is a nice balance where we're doing a lot and we're able to you know, uh, achieve the things that we want to and help the people who we want to be helping, um, but we're not overwhelming ourselves. So these three stages, ramping up, saying no, and choosing well, I think most of us experience these. And I'm not going to talk about ramping up right now just because uh, there's a lot more to talk about, um, but if, we want, if you want me to come back to it during the Q&A, please ask. I, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, but we'll start with talking about saying no. Um, this is a really tricky thing. Um, we are, as librarians, helpers. Um, we're yes people. We want to help whoever comes our way with a need or request. And so I think sometimes we get uh, trapped in that uh, that desire to serve. And that can lead to burnout, it can lead to inability to perform in the ways that we want. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard the term imposter syndrome. Uh, if you have, could you use the raise hand button at the top of the screen um, just to let me know that you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, you can say, uh, you can say no. I see a lot of you uh, raising your hand now. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard of this concept, um, imposter syndrome is uh, the feeling that you as a professional um, aren't really as up to speed as the rest of your colleagues. Other people know a lot more than you do. Um, and you fear that you'll be found out as a fraud in your profession. Now, this is rarely based in reality, but a whole lot of people go through these emotions. I know that I do pretty regularly. Um, and some studies have said up to 70% of working professionals experience this to some extent. I really liked this quote you see on the screen. This is from Char Booth. She is the Dean of the Libraries at CSU San Marcos. She writes a lot about instructional design and pedagogy, but she wrote this post about imposter syndrome and um, really pointed to how um, this sort of myth of self can have a lot of really negative consequences in the ways that we approach our colleagues and the way we approach our career. Um, I think to a large extent, um, this accounts for some of our inability to say no, because we're always trying to prove ourselves um, and trying to say, hey, I'm a competent professional, I can do these things. 
So we want to say yes and yes and yes, um, but that can be a bit damaging. Um, another thing I want to point to, um, there is uh, a fantastic Twitter chat that's been going on for the last several months uh, titled Lively Gender, uh, hashtag li Lively Gender. And they had a conversation just a few weeks ago about imposter syndrome specifically. Um, I should mention, I don't think these links are clickable in the slides the way I have them set up, um, but I will be tweeting the links later. And if anybody uh, wants to retype them into the chat so people can click them, that would be cool as well. Um, but yeah, they had a really fantastic discussion and I encourage you to go there uh, to hear a little bit more about it. Thank you, Eric, for, uh, for putting those links in. I really appreciate it. Um, the other thing that I came across as I was looking into this, um, I found a blog post by an, another early career librarian, Ketsai Barrientos. Uh, this was on the uh, blog of ACRL. And she was talking about how, um, oh, sorry, Eric, we'll, we'll get it later. Um, she was talking about um, how she has difficulty saying no in projects and trying to grapple with, you know, I say yes to so many things and I know that my plate is already full, but why do I say yes to things? And she said something really fascinating, that um, we as early career professionals often have the mindset that we can't really afford to say no. We're just getting started. We're trying to ramp ourselves up into our careers. And we're not quite sure when that transition is, when we can say, okay, that's enough. I've got what I can handle for right now and everything else will have to wait. Um, so this, uh, this really resonated with me quite a lot. Um, so I also um, thank you to a lot of you who responded to the survey and said some really insightful things about this. I really liked this quote by Elizabeth Davidson. Um, she is a library director at a liberal arts college in Connecticut. And I like how she pointed to the fact that everyone is, everyone has these kinds of challenges. Um, and it's okay to recognize that we only mostly know what we're doing most of the time. And that all of us are in that boat. I think we try to, um, to perform professionalism, which is good. We wanna be perceived as competent professionals, but it can, be, uh, it can be really freeing to recognize like, okay, all of us are kind of in the same boat that we may know a little bit more or a little bit less about particular things, but we all have something to contribute. So thank you, Elizabeth, for bringing that up. So I have, a couple of tips that have worked for me, and then we'll have a little bit of time um, where I want to hear from you. Um, the first thing that's been really helpful for me to recognize as I'm learning to say no is the power of delegation. Um, and by this, we usually mean from a supervisor to the people who report to them or, um, or a team leader to the rest of the team, delegating tasks from above to below. I like to think about delegation a little bit more broadly. That delegation is really about knowing the people around you and knowing what they're interested in, how they wanna contribute, what they'd be excited to do, and then recognizing opportunities to give them the gift of doing the things that they're excited about. Um, I try to do this um, really in a lot of context. And this requires uh, knowing a lot about your coworkers and about your colleagues in professional associations, having those conversations about what really excites you about the work you do. And when you see an opportunity for that person saying, hey, Sue would get a whole lot of that, a whole lot more out of that experience than I could, or maybe she could do a better job than I could. Um, and so sometimes as a strategy for saying no, um, when an opportunity comes my way, I try to say, okay, I could do that. I could probably do a good job of it. But is there somebody around me who could either do a better job or who would get more out of the experience than I can? Um, it can be a really powerful tool that rather than just saying, no, that's a bad idea, we're not going to do it, you can say, I know exactly the right person, and that person uh, will be able to flourish and, uh, and to do fantastic things while you're not constantly overburdening yourself. Another thing that I think it's important to recognize is um, the power of knowing what you're capable of doing and doing what you can, giving yourself a little bit of slack. Uh, I was giving a similar talk to this last weekend, and um, somebody in the audience, uh, it was Ben Wagner from Buffalo, he said, um, you know, not all projects need 100%. And one of the skills that we developed as professionals is recognizing when it's okay to give 
60 or 70 percent to a project when good enough is good enough and i think it's a uh, an important thing to bring up here that you know we as librarians i know this is true for myself we always want to give a hundred percent we always want a polished product at the end it's a good impulse um, but recognizing what things do i really need to give a hundred percent to and what can i afford to get by on 70 percent um, i think it's an important distinction to make um, and I also really liked uh, what this anonymous person said on the survey. Um, they, uh, they mentioned how, uh, how everybody has these kinds of things, echoing Elizabeth to some extent, um, and the power of talking with people in community um, and recognizing that we're all kind of in this boat together. And a lot more people have had experiences of imposter syndrome and feeling overwhelmed and not being sure how to say no um, than just just me. So I think, uh, so thank you to that anonymous person for, for bringing that up. I think it's important. So I'm going to pause here for a second and get some tea for myself. Um, but I want to hear in the chat, how do you say no? And, uh, and what do you find helpful? I'll be back in just a second. Okay, I am back. Um, so thank you for so many really valuable comments in the chat. I um, may or may not be able to get to all of them, but but Matt, have you been uh, keeping an eye on what's been coming up there? I have, and it seems as though there are some there are some really good ideas. Uh, you know, looking at uh, is it on the strategic plan for the library, or is it uh, is it in your personal goals? Learning how to kind of suss out from a manager uh, uh, or person of responsibility whether it's okay to say no. Um, others have found that. Uh, saying no is is, uh, is is continuing to be a challenge, that it's you know, figuring out that right way, that tactic uh, may be more nuanced depending on where you are. Um, uh, I've seen several people mention <laughs> that saying no is is a negotiation. Uh, and you know learning to do so is is especially difficult at an early career point because that negotiation process might not be something that, that people have as much experience with. But, um, you know, I think throughout we see this setting a, a standard for communication and rapport with the people who you are uh, hopefully <laughs> learning to say no to. Yeah, I think that's really important that all of these conversations happen in relationship. Uh, so thank you so much for all of you who brought that up. Um, I think that's a really important thing. I like the idea of framing saying no as a negotiation. I hadn't really thought about it exactly that way. 
um, yeah, I think that's really great that, you know, the same skills that we use to um, deal with accepting a job offer or in um, in negotiating exactly what um, what the scope of a project might be. Yeah, that's the same skill to be able to say, we both really want the same things. And how do we come to an agreement that uh, that's good for both of us and healthy for me in not being overwhelmed and healthy for you in the work that needs to be done getting done? Yeah, I think that's really great. Um, one other thing that I saw a few people saying was, um, saying no is a way of saying yes to other things. Um, and I think that's a really important perspective that when we're up above that 100%, um, it's hard to uh, say yes to the things that matter or to emergencies. Emergencies will happen. Uh, so it's important to have that, which is an excellent segue to, um, to the next part of the graph here, which is about choosing well. Um, I think it's probably true. And again, totally scientific numbers. Um, but I bet that most people thrive around the 85 to 95% mark, where you're doing a lot, able to, um, to serve the needs that are around you, um, but also able to have a little bit of room to breathe and to handle the emergencies that come up. The best concept that I've seen for um, articulating this that's been helpful to me is the concept of margin. Um, and this margin, the space between what you're committed to and the the maximum of your capacity um, gives you the ability to do a few things. It gives you the ability to say yes to the important things that come along that you really want to be spending time on. It gives you the ability to respond to emergencies. Um, a good example of this, last week, uh, the last couple of weeks, um, you might have seen in the, in the news that the University of Rochester had a bit of a norovirus scare. I think we're all fine now. We're basically out of the woods. Fortunately, you're on a webinar, so you can't catch anything. Yay! Um, but that was something that came up and we serve coffee in the library. So as soon as that scare started happening, I needed to be able to free up some time to say, how are we going to cope with, um, with all of the coffee that we serve and making sure that we're not serving as a vector for norovirus? Um, and having margin to have those conversations, um, can be really important. The other thing that I uh, think margin is really important for is the ability to sit back and reflect and recognize what are the things that I've been working on? Are they the things I want to be doing? Um, what, what do I see myself doing in the future? Um, I got a lot of these ideas from this guy called Sean Blanc. I don't know if anyone of you have uh, heard them, heard of him. Feel free to, uh, to raise your hand. Um, but yeah, Sean Blanc, really fantastic writer on um, on productivity and workflows and procrastination and personal vision. Um, so he's written a lot about the concept of margin, and I really encourage you to take a look at his stuff. It's really great. Um, so, excuse me for a second while I advance my secret slide deck so I can actually see what I'm about to talk about. Um, I think one of the most important things um, about uh, having margin is being able to take a step back and cast a vision like I was just talking about. So here you are, you are Mr. or Miss Duck, and you're looking out over the course of your career and asking yourself, what do I want to be doing in the future? What kinds of things um, are working for me? What isn't? Um, and what, what do I want to be doing in a year or five years or 10 years? I think it's a, it's a really important question for us to ask ourselves. Um, and then even more important than that, I think, is developing some kind of plan and saying, all right, in five years, I want to be doing X, Y, and Z. How am I going to get there? Um, now, of course, we have to fully recognize that whatever plan we make is going to end up being totally fictional and will not happen the way that we expected. Um, but it gives us a guidepost. It gives us a, uh, a goal to look at to say, what what would it look like if in five years I actually end up doing that thing? What steps would I have to take along the way? And recognizing that things will change, it gives you something to look back at and say, okay, it's been it's been six months. Where are we? Are we where we want to be going? Um, I think I think it's an important thing to be able to not just say, uh, 
to say, I want to be doing this thing, but here's how I'm going to get there. Um, I'm seeing a question from St. John Fisher. Suggestions for those that may not have a solid plan or idea on what they want in five years. I do have one of those. Um, and I'll get to it right here, actually. So this is a tool that I've found pretty useful for myself in thinking through what I want those plans to be. Um, so, and I've seen this in a lot of different places. It seems that like four or five different groups like independently maybe came up with this same kind of chart and none of them cite each other. So I'm just gonna put it here and say it's not mine. Um, but the idea with this is you start by saying, what do I wanna be doing someday? That someday could be five years from now, could be one year from now, could be a month from now. And you put that in the upper left. And then, In the lower right, you want to be giving a webinar on early career transitions. Um, your tomorrow might be, okay, tomorrow I'm going to write a list to myself. What transitions have I gone through in my career? And then maybe in a week, where could that take me? Okay, I could start generalizing that list a little bit and saying, what kinds of transitions do people go through and why are those important? And you're able to fill in sort of from both sides. And, uh, and you're able to say, okay, how... How can I get from tomorrow to that someday? And I think, um, speaking to the question from St. John Fisher, um, I think five years is sometimes a really long timeline. Um, if you've got a plan that, uh, that you want to do in five, 10, or 20 years, great. But sometimes it's okay to just think, like, what do I want to be doing in the next year? What kinds of skills do I want to develop? These don't have to be grand plans. They could be everything from you know, I want to be a dean of a library to I want to survive this instruction season. Um, I think those goals, the same kind of process applies. Um, does that get at the kind of thing you were hoping to hear? I'm not quite sure that I'm answering your question well. I see that you're typing. Yay, great. So, um, so yeah, I think this kind of tool can be really useful in helping to think through those things. And again, recognizing that, uh, that those things are going to change over time. And it's OK to look back at this thing in a month and say, ooh, that plan, I don't really like that anymore. I don't want to do x, y, or z. Um, I've discovered w. OK, great. Now you get to make a plan for w. And you got to see where you got to in a month. Um, so that can be really valuable. Um, not all plans have to be completed, especially when it comes to career development. It's OK to have a plan and abandon it at some point, and also reflect on what you learned through that process and what you can carry forward. Um, I'm going to take this tea bag out, excuse me. Yay for tea that's not too bitter. The power of this kind of tool is also that it tells you a little bit about uh, whether or not new tasks that you want to take on actually fit in the kind of work that you want to do. So once you have that kind of plan, maybe you have several of them, maybe they're five years, maybe they're two months, uh, you get to compare new tasks that are coming in to that plan and say, does this actually advance me towards the kinds of things I want to be doing? Um, and that can be taken pretty broadly. You know, it might not be that it applies directly, but maybe it would introduce you to some people who would be helpful. Maybe it would help out a colleague who really needs it right now. So don't feel like those have to be restrictive. Uh, but at the same time, it gives you a guidepost to say, you know, I'm working on a bunch of lemons right now. Is this fruit in front of me a lemon or a lime? And if it's a lime, you get to say, this doesn't fit for me right now. This doesn't fit the kinds of things I want to be working on. Um, and this allows you to make good choices about your career. So. Um, you all had a lot to say about this kind of thing in the survey. Um, so I'm going to like breeze through a couple of these. I realize we're about halfway through our time. Um, so Kristen Tottlebin uh, said something really fantastic that, um, and I, what this pointed to for me was the value in choosing well is that you get to do your best at things and you get to do what you say you're going to do, which is really important in developing relationships with colleagues. And, um, and I like that she also said, don't jump just to jump. Um, 
And that applies in a whole range of different things. Um, we're people who like to say yes. And it's important to have a vision of why am I jumping? Why am I taking this next step? Whether that's I'm going to take on this new task at work to I'm going to take this new job. I think that same advice applies. Thank you, Kristen. Um, this person learned that they weren't good at everything and they made a change in their career to reflect the kinds of things that they were good at and that they wanted to do. Um, I think that uh, I, I'm really glad to hear that. So, so thank you. Um, somebody else said um, that it's important to recognize the boundaries you have and to exercise them as soon as you can. Um, I highly agree with this. I think this is a really important thing. And it's important to be able to set those boundaries as early as you can um, in order to create a space where you're able to, um, to say yes or no to things and people expect it. Um, I think one of the challenges that I've gotten myself in in different parts of my life is I was always the yes person. I'm always like, yes, I will take on that project. Yes, I will do that thing. And I don't know that people ever felt entitled to it. Like, oh, Tyler will definitely say yes to the thing. But, um, but still, there's kind of setting that expectation. So I really liked that this person brought that up. And, um, and on that note, there was another person who had this really fantastic uh, observation that so often we think about our work as our job. We think about, you know, I'm at the University of Rochester. What are the things that I can do here to help my career? And I think that's important. It's important that we do things that support our job. That's, uh, that's our, main, uh, our main thing while we're in our professional careers, our jobs. Um, but I, I love that this person pointed to seeking out learning opportunities everywhere, whether or not um, you're able to get those kinds of things out of your workplace. Um, I think that points to the difference between one's job and one's career. And they overlap, they connect, but they're two distinct things. Um, that's been really important for me as I think about my work at Rochester and my work with ALA, for example. Um, so, so I think this is really great advice. Thank you for bringing this up. So I'm going to pause again for a second and actually drink a little bit of my tea. Um, but I want to hear from you. How do you choose well in your careers? How do you... Um, Select the kind of things you want to do going forward. How do you set vision for that? And how do you stick to it? Because that's probably the hardest part. So I will be back in a moment. Okay, I see that a couple of people are still typing. Please feel free to continue. I'm going to start browsing through this a little bit. Um, Matt, what kinds of things uh, so are you talking about? 
There's a couple of recurring themes again. One of them is knowing yourself in order to find the right fit. Um, being self-aware of what's important to you uh, helps you find those matches. Uh, the other one, and this plays on uh, something that you've discussed as well, is, is knowing your network and knowing uh, who is going to be able to help you with those tasks, who's going to be able to uh, to, to slot additional uh, uh, pegs into the grid as you need them to. Uh, so having having familiarity with those around you who might be able to share that burden is important. I want to also just flag, there's one comment, um, you know, uh, saying, I understand what you're saying, but putting into practice can be hard. I've not learned how to set these boundaries, so I find it very hard to say no. So, and, and this kind of, you know, these are all sides of the same coin, uh, and I thought I'd, I'd, I'd flag that one in particular to see if, if you had advice about, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're finding, you know, knowing yourself to, to find the right matches and knowing your network to find the right allies, how do you how do you develop those boundaries in a sustainable way uh, to put you on the spot? <laughs> this entire thing is me being put on the spot. That's totally okay. Um, so yeah, thank you, Jen, for bringing up that question. I think that's a really important one. And um, and everybody, please feel free to uh, to also uh, communicate in the chat. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a really tricky one. It can be difficult to figure out where those boundaries go, and then also um, figuring out how to how to enforce those. Um, that's a tricky thing. What has worked for me um, in thinking through those issues, um, I notice a lot of what I spend my time on. Um, uh, Another tip that I was going to bring up and I forgot to, um, what I've been trying to do in my career is at the end of every workday or every conference day, um, I sit back for a few minutes and write down just a list of what are the things I actually did that day. Um, and this doesn't have to be like a really formal Dear Diary entry, but just, um, you know, I went to this committee meeting, I worked on this report, I gave this talk, I'm going to be writing in that I gave this webinar and then that I hyperventilated a little bit afterwards. Um, and, uh, and so getting that kind of list can be helpful for a few reasons. Jen, to speak to your point, um, that, kind of, um, that kind of reflection has given me a little bit more awareness of what are the things that I actually spend my time on versus what I think I spend my time on or what I think I should be spending my time on or what other people Think I should be spending my time on, um, and it's been really revealing that um, you know the things that I spend the biggest blocks on, for example, tend to be creative projects. Uh, they tend to be either writing or um, or deciding how to present certain data or creating visualizations. Um, so that sort of peaked for me, like okay, those are the kinds of things I want to spend my time on. And they've also um, called attention to some things that I really don't want to be spending my time on and that I've had to set boundaries around. Um, so that's been one useful tool for me. Um, bonus tip, the other thing that this is really helpful with is performance evaluations. A little bit late for this season for a lot of people, but, um, but I highly recommend uh, keeping that kind of list. It makes things so much easier. Um, so I see a couple of people bringing up some points. Okay, Sarah, thank you. Um, yeah, Sarah is pointing to, uh, it's easier to practice this outside of work life sometimes, um, because it is all about knowing how to communicate. I think that's a really great point. Um, it's that same kind of negotiation. Um, and that is definitely a skill to be able to set boundaries and, um, and know how to communicate those well. Um, I think we could talk for a whole while about this. Um, so I want to be mindful of our time. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, but I can stick around for a couple of minutes afterward to talk a little bit further. Um, okay, so moving on from choosing well. Um, so I've spent this entire time so far talking about that first point, saying no. Um, and choosing well, I think, is also a big part of that. The other two, as I was working on this talk, I kept trying to separate them and say, first I'm going to talk about committees and teams, then I'm going to talk about projects. 
And then I realized these are really a lot of the same skills. Um, they're, they're very closely related, not identical, but, um, but a lot of the same things apply. So I'm going to talk about these together. Um, coming back to um, what I was just talking about a few minutes ago, um, just as you can create a plan for personal projects, personal goals, um, it's important to create plans for routines and plans for specific projects that you're doing in your workplace. Um, and this can be even more helpful as a communication tool. You know, if it's just me writing a plan for myself, I understand what I meant. But if I'm writing a plan for a group of people, it can be a little bit harder to get all the details across. So I think it's important to write this kind of thing out. Frequently you'll hear this kind of project plan talked about as a charter. And that comes from the sort of project management literature. But the basic idea of this is at the outset of a project, before you really dive into the work, you take some time to decide what is it that we're doing? Why are we doing it? What kinds of things do we want to, be, want to have done by the end of it? What does our schedule look like? Um, and setting these things out at the beginning can be so helpful for working on a committee or a team. Um, and also, as you're transitioning into project-based work and not just, I'm going to sit at the reference desk and answer these kinds of questions, whatever comes up. And I don't think many of us do that anymore. We spend so much more time on short or long-term projects. Um, so this kind of thing can be really important to take a step back at the, at the outset rather than just diving into the work to decide how you want to do it and what your goals are. Um, so at minimum, I think this kind of charter needs to have these things. And there's an example of one that I wrote for um, the podcast team of the new professional section of the Library Leadership and Management Association, which is part of ALA. Um, I won't go into the whole background of how that came to exist. That's a long and exciting story. Um, but I was writing a charter as chair of this section for a new podcast team that we got started. And, um, and so I was able to give those members a little bit of background of here's what we kind of want to do and where it's coming from. Here's the scope. You know, you can say whatever, you can do whatever kind of podcast you want, as long as it's about leadership and management for early career professionals. And then we gave a bit of a timeline and said, here are the kinds of things we want to do over the next few months. And then final outcomes. By the end of it, you will have done, I forget the number, it was eight or nine uh, podcast episodes over the course of about a year. Um, and you'll also make a recommendation at the end about whether or not we should continue. Um, I always put that last bit into any charter that I write. If it's something that could end, um, to give people the freedom to say, hey, we tried this thing, it was cool, but it's not really working, and we should probably direct our efforts elsewhere. Um, one of the dangers that we come across so frequently in libraries and in professional organizations like ALA or SLA is we keep doing things because we've done them for a long time. And, uh, and sometimes that's good. Sometimes those things need to keep happening. But sometimes there isn't really a good way out. Um, and so we keep doing the committees we've always done. So I think it's important as one of those final outcomes, if you can do it, to say, should we keep doing this thing? Should it be ongoing? Um, and to give people, the people on that team, the freedom to say, you know, it was a good idea, but it's not really working out and that's okay. And now we can spend our time on other things. Now we as a team get to choose well about something else we want to spend our time on. Um, this can get a whole lot more detailed, so I'm not going to go into all of the things. Um, sorry, people typing into the chat for links. I did not shorten these. Um, but if you just Google, um, Cecily Walker, she is a fantastic library technologist and project manager at the Vancouver Public Library, and she writes all kinds of fantastic things, but I loved these two posts about how she manages small projects. Um, really fantastic advice as you're getting started. Now, this is a very deep rabbit hole, um, lots of different styles of project management, um, different schools of thought, um, but what those core ideas really come down to is communication between all of the stakeholders in the project, all of the people who are either working on it or who are invested in it or, or who are benefiting from it, um, as well as planning and spending some time at the outset to say, what is it we're really doing? And revisiting that over time to say, are we still doing what we thought we were gonna do? Should we change that? And making sure that we ended up where we wanted to at the end on time insofar as possible. Um, 
a lot of things to talk about, but I highly recommend starting with those two blog posts from Cecily. Um, and I think this really gets back to, once you have that plan, uh, whether that's a project that you yourself are doing, a project that a committee that you're working with is doing, um, or as our work becomes more and more connected to, uh, to individual projects that may connect or may not, um, it gives us the ability to examine the scope of the work that we're doing and to say, as we're going forward on this project, we're gathering all kinds of things. This is a concept called scope creep, if you haven't heard of that where you say, well, we want to revamp our reference service. Okay, so we're going to stop sitting at the reference desk and we're gonna start chat and we're going to um, you know, change how we staff our desks and we're going to provide a whole new service by phone and we're gonna make posters. And you can see how this sort of thing can grow. We're, we as librarians are great at brainstorming. Um, but sometimes if we're not careful, the scope can become a lot more than we thought it was going to be. And, uh, and this can be dangerous. So having that charter and having um, a bit of a plan for how you're going to get the work done over time gives you the ability to say, this is a great idea, but it's a line. And we're going to take a, step, take a step back on that. Hold it for later, maybe we'll get to it sometime, but we need to stick to the work that we're doing right now. Um, a couple of words about facilitation, and this is more on the committee and team side. Um, what I've noticed a lot as I've started managing different, uh, different teams at work and in ALA is the value of a good facilitator. Um, and this isn't necessarily the same as project management. This is a different set of skills. Project management is about how we get the work done and making sure we're doing the right work. Facilitation is about making sure that when we're spending time talking with each other, that we're doing it in an effective way, that we're spending our time well, and to encourage the creativity of the whole group, um, making sure that people with a lot of opinions get to express those, but also leave room for the people who might be a little bit quieter and to be able to create um, a better experience for everybody. Um, another post by Char Booth that I recommend you read later, she wrote one on facilitation, which has a lot of really fantastic ideas about effective facilitation. Um, but for me, and recognizing that I've got eight minutes left, um, the key to this is recognizing that everyone in the room has something to contribute and ensuring that, okay, we're getting through our agenda items. We know what we're trying to do but everyone's also getting a chance to weigh in as they need to. And then when things start to go off the rails, um, bringing everybody back together and saying, one thing that you know all of my coworkers have heard me say a lot is, what I think we're trying to say here is X. And I try to rephrase, like, here's what I'm hearing. Here's what I'm hearing around me. Here's a, a, a succinct way of phrasing that. And that tends to bring us back in and get us moving forward. Um, a lot of facilitation skills uh, that are important for us to develop as we lead groups. Um, I can't possibly leave without saying a word about meetings. Um, we all have too many of them. I thought about polling you all to see like how much of your time do you spend on meetings? But then I realized we all spend our time in a lot of meetings. So we're just gonna acknowledge that and take it as true. Um, a couple of tips that I've, uh, that I've learned about meetings from a lot of people. Uh, first, do you need to have one? Um, there are a lot of times that we say, okay, we're going to work on something. Let's all get together to talk about it. But we don't necessarily think of, okay, do we actually need to get together and talk about it? Or do we already basically know what we're going to do and we can kick around a few emails to figure out the details? It costs a lot of time uh, to gather six or eight or ten people together to spend an hour um, discussing things. Um, so it's important to make sure that, okay, we really do need to be all in the same room or all on Skype to, uh, to have an effective conversation and move forward well. Um, I'm a big believer in pre-work. Um, and that is, you know, if there's reports that everyone needs to be aware of or ideas that everyone needs to come to the table with, let people spend that time ahead of time. It's easier for people to read, to spend 30 seconds reading somebody's written report than to spend 10 minutes in a meeting discussing all the details of it. 
Um, so pre-work, great strategy. Um, going into the meeting, I always try to express outcomes and say, by the end of this meeting, we will have decided on a schedule for the party, or you know, we will have a list of ideas that we want to bring into this project charter. And knowing from the outset, here's what we're trying to do, is a way to help keep people on task and to say, uh, as people come in with other ideas and the conversation veers over one way or the other, you get to say, that's a really great idea and I think we should come back to it. Um, but I think right now we need to work on brainstorming for that, for that project. Um, staying on task is important. And then always ending on time. Um, everyone knows the meeting that just drags on like, oh, we just need a couple of more minutes. Oh, hang on before you leave one more thing. No. Um, end on time. Everyone loves that. Um, and so that is why I am rushing through a little bit of this to make sure that we end by 12. Um, one last thing that somebody brought up in the survey, um, and this was a general comment that I think fit into a few places. Um, as early career professionals, we come in with all sorts of great ideas, but we're frequently told, um, you know, oh, we've always done it this way, or let's not talk about that right now. There's a lot of history. It's important to listen to those things, but it's also important to keep bringing those things to the table and to keep asking, why is it that we do things this way? What happened uh, that led us to do things this way? Hey, I have this idea. Does that fit into the conversation that we're having? Um, I think it's, it's important for us as uh, people going through transitions in our careers to recognize that, uh, that we have good ideas too and we should bring them up. So I have one last question for you. We're just going to take a minute. Um, please feel free to type into the chat, what makes a good project to you? And what makes a good meeting? What tips do you have for people to be successful? Okay, so uh, thank you so much uh, to everybody who was bringing things up. I was standing off to the side and, uh, and watching a little bit of what was coming in. Uh, Matt, what did you see that, uh, that came out of that? Well, uh, one priority was snacks, uh, <laughs> which we, we know that is important. Um, but uh, having uh, outcomes and knowing what you're trying to accomplish seems to be a big uh, a big piece of feedback that everybody gave. Uh, additionally, having uh, and this is kind of said in a few different ways, uh, having a people and a space that are on target so that the people feel like they can share. And they they come to a meeting uh, knowing who they're in the room with and how they can work together. Um, uh, but having that you know having that environment and that team be be really ready to 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 start in seems to be a, a really 
big part and that you know that allows the uh, feedback to be provided and that allows uh, a more focused uh, approach to, to to be created so those are that's 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 the gloss over yeah I think that creating a comfortable space I could spend another long while facilitating a conversation around that because that means something a little bit different for everybody so the job of the facilitator is to figure out who are the people who are in the room with me and what will make them feel successful um, I think that's a great place for us to leave this part of the conversation. It is 12 o'clock and I'm going to uh, get you out of here on time. Uh, here are all the photos. I can stick around until about 12.15 if people want to keep talking. Um, we got to three of these, uh, these uh, uh, transitions, but there are a lot more that we haven't discussed. So with that, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for being a fantastic group of people to talk with. and. Um, I look forward to talking with you in the future. You can find me on Twitter at silent underscore D. Thank you for your time. And thank you, Tyler, for taking the time today and sharing this knowledge. Uh, uh, the slides, I believe, will be available after this, uh, if that's correct, yes. Um, and uh, we will be uh, posting this uh, up on YouTube. Uh, so we'll, we'll be sending out links to all of that in the coming days. So keep an eye on your inbox for that. Uh, one way to make sure that you get that, we'll also be posting links to those at the end of the survey once it's up. Uh, anybody, so just you know, make sure that you uh, complete that survey. Uh, uh, it really helps us, and um, uh, it will make sure that we get you the resources that you need as well. But um, thank you so much to Tyler, and thanks to everybody who joined us today for a fantastic discussion. And please feel free to send us additional suggestions, additional questions, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll be able to keep the conversation going. Um, so with that, if anybody has any additional questions for Tyler, uh, now's the time. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I like I said, I can stick around until 12.15, and then I've got to run to the next thing. So, um, so after party. What do people want to talk about? It looks like looks like people may be sated for the time being. Oh, a couple more people might be typing. I see a couple of people typing. I don't know where you're typing, thank you, which is great. Uh, <laughs> I want to make sure that, uh, that we get to those last few things. Ooh, okay, Elizabeth had a question. I don't know whether this is Elizabeth Davidson. Um, if you are, please let me know because, hi, you're awesome. Um, yay, it is. Um, talk about how to approach leaving a project when you decide it's no longer fitting your goals. That is, that is a really fascinating thing. Um, hmm. I, I guess there are a couple of different thoughts that I have. Um, First, is it a project that you can leave? Um, I, I guess it depends on the context, right? Like, is this something that um, someone is either someone powerful is asking me to do? You know, if my dean asks me to work on a project, I'm going to have to take a few more steps to escape it. Um, if it was just a colleague, not just a colleague, but you know what I mean, um, who said, "Hey, could you help out with this thing?" Um, it can be a little bit easier to back out. You know, one thing that I have said to a lot of people, especially recently, is, um, you know, I think that's a really great idea that we've been working on. Um, I'm going to need to take a step back for the next month or two while I prepare for this webinar that I'm presenting. Um, could we talk about it again in June? Um, and so if it's something that's not as time sensitive, um, sometimes that's a good strategy that's worked for me. Um, the other thing is, um, and this was a suggestion that someone brought up at um, a conference I was at um, last weekend. They said um, that it's important to, even if you're trying to escape the commitments that you currently have in a project, it's important to say what you are able to do. You know, it might be, hey, I've loved working on designing this survey. Um, I'm definitely willing to proofread it once you guys have uh, have a draft figured out. I think that's the way I can most be helpful right now. Um, so that kind of bait and switch, I want to say, um, that's a little bit crude, but um, but to say, you know, 
I've been working on it in this way. I think the best way for me to be successful and to be helpful is to work on it in this different way. That can kind of be a way to transition out. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. I'd also be interested to hear what other people have to say in the chat about that. I think that's a, a really interesting question. Um, Elizabeth, did that get at the kind of thing that you were asking about? And people at Fisher said, being honest has been really helpful. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Ooh, yes, and nothing is forever. Sometimes there's an awful project, you're stuck in it, but it's gonna end in August. Um, that can be a really helpful thing to remember. And then, hey, in September, you get to have a party because the terrible project is over. Um, that is always excellent. Um, Denise, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, you were asking about entering your first professional position. Oh no, come on chat, cooperate with me. I can only see like one line at a time. Entering your first professional position or leaving your position for better opportunities. Um, that is that is interesting. I think that's a broad, um, a broad question. Um, so I'm interested, if you do have a specific thing you'd like me to talk about, um, I'm happy to discuss that. Um, I see that you're typing, so I'll let you continue doing that. Yeah, I think that's that's a really challenging thing. No, it's fine. Um, okay. How do you say thank you for the opportunity, but I need to leave? Um, yeah, I think that's that's a hard conversation. I have not personally been in uh, in a situation where I had to leave. Um, I have. Well, I've been in that context in projects, but um, but yeah, I, I'd be interested for those of you who are in the room who have left one professional position for another in how you had that conversation, because I can just kind of speculate off the top of my head. Um, what I think has been helpful in that sort of thing for me is recognizing what I'm going to and saying, and I think this gets to some things we were talking about before, um, and one of the survey comments that I, I brought up before, um, that you know, if you recognize that your strengths aren't as, uh, as helpful in your current role as they would be in another role that you wanna take on, um, it can be good to recognize that and to spend some time reflecting. You know, I imagine if I were in that situation, I would say to myself first, what is it about this new job that excites me? You know, is it I would get to spend a lot more time working with students or I'd get to supervise more people or, um, or this would allow me to, uh, to have a little bit more autonomy in the kinds of things that I'm doing. And I think that may help ease that conversation a bit. Um, I think it depends a lot. It depends a lot on, um, and Elizabeth, you're saying it depends on the relationship with your supervisor. That is absolutely true. Um, I'm lucky to have a supervisor who I feel comfortable talking with about any career issue. Um, so if and when inevitably I leave Rochester, um, she and I will be able to have a really healthy conversation about that. Of course, not every supervisor is as receptive to those conversations. So yeah, Elizabeth, I think you're absolutely right. Um, Leslie, leaving a part-time gig for a full-time position. Yeah, sometimes you can't pass up that opportunity. Um, and that reminds me, I did actually have exactly that situation. I was in a, uh, it wasn't part-time, but it was a temp job at UNC. Um, and it was going to last several months. Um, and I was in that when I got the job here at U of R. Um, it was an easier conversation for me in that context because both my supervisor and I knew that it was a temp job and it wasn't going to become a permanent thing. Um, so, so when I walked into her office and said, hey, do you have a few minutes to chat? She knew immediately that we were about to have that conversation and she was incredibly supportive. Um, I think, yeah, that kind of thing. I like that phrasing, Leslie, of, you know, thank you for the opportunity, but I can't pass up the opportunity for a full-time position. And that again gets to, you know, what are you getting out of this upcoming job that you're not necessarily getting out of the one that you're currently in? I think that's very important. It's always scary when the chat says multiple attendees are typing because I have no idea how many of you there are. 
some great suggestions coming in there. Uh, Elizabeth, you're pointing to something really important. Um, yeah, that is that is really crucial. That not every relationship is going to be perfect or go well. Um, and you know, I think all of us would advise don't burn bridges if you don't have to. Sometimes other people burn bridges too, um, and it's okay to look out for yourself. Um, you know, if a supervisor is going to be upset that you're taking care of yourself and doing what's right for you and your career, um, that's on them at some point. And it's okay to recognize that. Um, you know, you don't want to be overly cruel about that or, um, and it's okay for them to be sad. In fact, it's better if they're sad that you're leaving rather than, you know, really excited that they don't have to see you anymore. Um, but, but yeah, sometimes that does cross a line into why are you leaving? How could you possibly do that? Um, which is not appropriate. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that goes well for you, Denise. Thank you so much for asking that. Are there any other things people want to bring up? I've got five minutes. Oh, saw one scroll by. Where did it go? Nicole, I see you. How do I make sure I'm prepared to get another job with a gap in the field? Yeah, and I think I think you and I talked about this uh, in person one time. It was you or somebody else who may be in the same situation. Um, yeah, that is that is a really interesting question. Um, prepared to get another job with a gap. Um, I mean, of course, you want to have a story for that gap. Uh, that um, and that doesn't have to be a really long story. Um, that can just be, you know, I, um, you know, moved to another location for some personal commitments and now I'm ready to enter a field that I love again. Um, that can be a, a sort of straightforward way to say that sort of thing. Um, and, and yeah, I think it's, so one, having that kind of story ready to tell, um, Two, I think a lot of the same advice that I would give to somebody entering their first professional position would apply here, just in the sense of recognizing, you know, what kinds of places do you want to be working in? What kinds of experience are you bringing to this? Um, why is why are you the perfect person for this job? Um, don't phrase it, I am the perfect person for this job. That will go badly. But think about it. You know, why would you excel in this role? And that can be really helpful in in addressing things in a cover letter. Elizabeth also brought up um, that if it's a very long gap, it should be addressed in the cover letter. That is, that is important. And as far as what a very long gap is, I think if you ask five people, you'll get seven opinions. Um, for me, that's between like, you know, once you get over about a year, that's when, you know, ears start to perk up and you're like, oh, why is this person out of this workplace for a while? Usually that's not a bad thing as long as it's addressed. Um, but I think that's, that's one of the most helpful things. I see that you're typing more so I'll let you let you jump in Okay, yeah, yeah, and, and we had talked about this. Yeah, volunteering and doing workshops, I think, is is really fantastic as a way to to get experience that you can talk about in the immediate past, um, which uh, which can be helpful and and a good way to sort of, I imagine, get yourself uh, back into the mindset of okay, library stuff, library jobs, library work, uh, how does that function? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that any past experience you have is invalid. Um, it depends a lot on the particular jobs that you're applying for and the particular experiences that you have. Um, but it can be totally okay to point to that and say, you know, back in 2007, I, um, you know, managed XYZ kind of project that helped users in ways A, B, and C. Um, and that can be a totally okay thing to say if it's if it's relevant experience. 
Um, do any other, do, does anyone else have uh, have good advice? And you're welcome. Well, on behalf of everybody here and on behalf of ESLN, uh, thank you, Tyler, so much for your help and uh, and insights. And thanks again to everybody for participating. Uh, we're 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 really happy with the turnout and happy with the discussion. So uh, please, uh, once this goes live, please share it with your colleagues and do take two minutes to uh, fill out the survey, which you'll be redirected to as soon as we close out. Uh, so with that, uh, thanks everybody and we'll see you again very soon. All right, great. Thank you so much. Talk to you all later.